I'm Carrie Konoski, and this is Kidney Cancer News for July. Now, here's Bill Bro with a roundup of late breaking news. Thank you, Carrie. News from Boston and researchers at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center that an antibody helps a person's own immune system to battle cancer cells and shows increasing promise in reducing tumors in patients with advanced kidney cancer. Results of an expanded Phase I trial presented at the American Society of Clinical Oncology's annual meeting in Chicago showed that some patients treated with a fully human monoclonal antibody developed by Bristol Myers Squibb had a positive response to the effort by the agent without some of the debilitating side effects common to earlier immunotherapies. Now, highlights from the recent 2012 European International Kidney Cancer Symposium in Vienna, Austria. And I've been asked to speak on the most conservative end of the treatment spectrum in first-line metastatic renal cell carcinoma. So we've heard already at this meeting that renal cell carcinoma is a heterogeneous disease. There are nine histopathological subtypes, but increasingly we're recognizing that within those histopathological subtypes and furthermore within individual patients, there's marked genomic variation and the presence of, of tumor heterogeneity. And it seems likely that the histopathological variation and genomic variation gives rise to diverse biological behavior in this disease. And that translates into the clinic. Um, and this, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence for differing um, sub clinical subsets of patients, those with an aggressive tempo of, of disease and those with a very indolent pace of disease, particularly those patients with lung metastases only. Although there have been huge advances in the systemic treatment for metastatic renal cell carcinoma, treatments remain palliative and therefore chronic, and they're moderately toxic. And so our practice, at least in the UK, has been to defer drug therapy until there is a clinically relevant burden of disease. And the main argument for this has been from the point of view of patient quality of life. And, and this is a practice which I think is, is widespread in other tumour types as well. But there is actually very little evidence to tell us that this is a safe approach. In indolent lymphoma, there is prospective evidence for a watchful waiting approach. But the difference between indolent lymphoma and renal cell carcinoma is that rituximab is relatively non-toxic. It has been suggested from a randomised discontinuation trial of seraph serafinib that patients are not disadvantaged by a brief time off treatment. But we wanted to, to try and more formally evaluate our practice, and we particularly wanted to do this in the kinase inhibitor era. And so our starting point was looking at patients who'd been treated with sinitinib between 2005 and 2010 at the Royal Marsden and at Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital. And within that group of sinitinib-treated patients, we identified those who had had a planned period of observation prior to kinase inhibitor therapy because of asymptomatic or slowly progressive disease. And our primary aim was to determine the progression-free survival or clinical outcomes of those patients once they actually started first-line systemic therapy. It was a very simple study schema. We retrospectively identified patients who'd been diagnosed with metastatic disease and in who there'd been a clinical decision to observe initially. Um, that, that was 62 patients out of about 200 treated with sinitinib. We wanted to measure the observation period and then look at the progression-free survival and overall survival of those patients once they'd started treatment. And although we looked at patients treated with sinitinib in that time period, some of these patients had previously had been treated with interferon after, after a period of observation. The study cohort was very typical for an advanced renal cell carcinoma population, mostly male patients, mostly had clear cell carcinoma, and the mean age at diagnosis was 57 years. About half had had metastasectomy at some point and radiotherapy, 
and not surprisingly, almost all were in the favourable risk group as defined by MSKCC score. And I should say also that almost all of these patients had had a nephrectomy and an interval between curative surgery and the diagnosis of metastatic disease. Progression of disease on imaging or clinician anxiety was the most common reason that treatment was initiated. And a third of patients developed symptoms from their disease and, and were started on treatment for that reason. Here the, the time on observation varied very widely, um, but the average time on, obs on observation for these patients was, was 18 months. I was somewhat surprised to see the difference um, in observation time between sinitinib and interferon. I would have thought with the advent of a new effective treatment there would have been more enthusiasm for starting treatment earlier and I can't easily explain these uh, figures but that is one of the limitations of a, of a retrospective review. The clinical outcomes for these patients were, were reassuring. The median progression-free survival time for patients on sinitinib, 39 patients, was 9 months, and for interferon was 6.7 months. And overall, the median progression-free survival was 9 months. And the overall survival data also was, was comparable for this general population. So overall, there was a median overall survival of 25 months. And particularly in the interferon group, there was a very prolonged survival. But again, this is a retrospective review, clearly limited by, by selection. A brief comment about toxicity from sinitinib. It was very common. And actually, hospital admission for sinitinib-related toxicity was required in 13% of patients. And most patients ended up having a dose reduction for toxicity. So in this selected cohort of patients with indolent, favourable and, or intermediate prognosis metastatic renal cell carcinoma, first-line systemic therapy was deferred by a mean of over one year. And once patients started on sinitinib treatment, the median progression-free survival and overall survival times were comparable to those observed in the larger prospective trials of sinitinib. This is a retrospective analysis. The confidence intervals for the data were very wide and it's impossible to exclude selection bias. And I think although we can cautiously conclude that in this particular group of patients, deferring therapy seems a reasonable practice, we aren't in any way enlightened as to what defines that group of patients. And for this reason, we think that prospective evaluation of surveillance as a treatment strategy is, is critical. And we hope that it might help us to define that group of patients for whom delayed systemic therapy is ideal. And I think the, the, the major challenge of treating um, metastatic renal cell carcinoma exists in this treatment strategy, that we have no molecular means by which to select patients for treatment. We've assumed that deferring systemic therapy ha will have a positive impact on quality of life, but it's possible that patient anxiety from not having treatment might have the opposite effect. And so studying this prospectively would allow longitudinal assessment of quality of life. And it might allow us to perform some of that much needed translational research, not only with tissue collection, but um, looking for predictive biomarkers with less invasive sampling means. Importantly, most developed countries are facing a situation of drug rationing and the strategy of observing patients in this population might have significant health economic benefits. And for all of these reasons, we wholly support a prospect of observational study which is currently recruiting and being led by Dr. Rennie. Thank you for your time and to my co-investigators and colleagues at the Royal Marsden Hospital and at Guy's and St Thomas's and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I would like to start this presentation thanking uh, the scientific committee for this kind invitation uh, uh, for the Saturn project on behalf of all the members of the uh, Saturn project. Um, sorry. 
Um, I am the coordinator of uh, this uh, uh, Italian project uh, together with Nicola Longo and uh, Alchiede Simonato and uh, this uh, is a multi-center retrospective uh, national study including data coming from 16 referral Italian centers and we included uh, in this database so all the patients who underwent partial or radical nephrectomy for localized or advanced uh, uh, RCC in the period between 1995 and 2007 and we performed for all cases the follow-up in 2009 and at this moment uh, we have the possibility to evaluate the results in more than 5,000 uh, cases. In one of the first paper of this experience published in 2010 by my colleagues Giacomo Novara in the European Urology about the uh, validation of the 2009 version of the TNM staging system, uh, we noted that uh, uh, histologic subtypes turned, uh, turned out to be an independent predictor of cancer-specific survival at multivariable analysis. And therefore, this observation uh, supported our uh, conviction and our idea that uh, renal cell carcinomas are different, um, uh, different uh, uh, types of tumors with different morphology, with different molecular characteristics, and as, at the same time with different cytogenetic findings. And this concept is uh, always present and is considered also when we look at, at the different uh, response of these uh, tumor histotypes uh, for medical uh, therapy. And, uh, Usually, the most important guidelines like NCCN consider uh, papillary RCC in the big folder of the no clear cell histology. But we must pay attention when we put together all the different tumor histotypes in the no clear cell uh, folders because. Um, as you can see in this slide, we have uh, chromophobe RCC, papillary RCC, but also unclassified and Bellini tumor with uh, a prognosis significantly worse in comparison with papillary and chromophobe histological subtypes. And the same consideration uh, uh, were um, from this paper uh, published in 2008 in the BJU International from Capitanio and uh, uh, co-workers. Uh, co As you can see also in this experience, the survival of papillary RCC is in the middle between chromophobe and clear cell RCC. And again, when we look at the most important paper published in the literature in this field, we can observe that the percentages of the five-year cancer-specific survival is uh, uh, in the middle between uh, the uh, worst prognosis represented by clear cell RCC and the best prognosis represented by chromophobe. But I ask you to pay attention to these differences in the five-year cancer-specific survival between uh, these two studies, one coming from Mayo Clinic after slight revision process and another one that is a multi-institutional study uh, from uh, uh, European centers in which uh, we observed a uh, uh, a five-year cancer-specific survival significant lower, but without slide revision of the uh, uh, cases. And this is an important message, because in these uh, little uh, studies published by myself in 2006, we demonstrated that for papillary RCC, the originally assigned um, uh, cases, the uh, cancer-specific survival is different uh, in comparison with the cases uh, assigned as a papillary RCC after slide revision. And this is a very important above all when we consider it in the retrospective analysis cases observed and treated before 1997. And for this reason, we started with this study with a uh, uh, Saturn project, uh, including uh, uh, cases uh, uh, observed and treated from 1997. And this is the publication in the European, in the BJU uh, in, uh, Urology about the prognostic factors in papillary RCC. Our task was to evaluate the prognostic factors in uh, 577 cases observed in this multi-institutional experience. As you can see, looking at the characteristic of patient, we have a mean age of 62 years. The majority of these present showed a symptomatic disease, and we performed in 62% of cases radical nephrectomy, in 32 cases an elective nephron sparing surgery, and in 6% 6, in 6 of cases an imperative nephron sparing surgery. But very important when we look at the pathological characteristics 
characteristics of this tumor, we uh, observed that 80% of the cases were localized tumors, and only in 10% of the cases we have patients with lymph node involvement or distant metastasis at presentation. And very important is that 30% of cases uh, were grade 3 or 4 according to uh, Furman classification, and this patient can be considered uh, uh, as a type 2 according to the classification of the Lount and uh, Ebor. And uh, concerning oncological outcomes, uh, in this experience, uh, we uh, have a median follow-up of uh, 39 months with uh, 464 patients alive, and this is free, uh, with a median follow-up of 42 months. 40% uh, of cases had a disease progression, 11% uh, of cases died for the disease, and 5% of the cases uh, died for other can uh, causes uh, not correlated with the kidney cancer. Looking at the recurrence-free survival, we observed a five-year recurrence-free survival of 85.5% of the cases, and the 10 years recurrence-free survival uh, was 73% of the cases. And when we analyze our data, uh, according to univariable and multivariable analysis, we showed that um, pathological T stage uh, was not statistically significant at the multivariable analysis, and uh, only lymph node involvement and presence of distant metastasis and the nuclear grading turned out to be independent predictors of recurrence-free survival in this patient. This is a very important message, above all, for the TNM classification, because I, I am convinced that uh, the majority of the information uh, coming uh, from the literature are uh, coming from clear cell RCC, and perhaps in our uh, TNM system uh, works and works very well for clear cell RCC, but probably uh, the situation for papillary or chromophobe or other uh, tumor histotypes is uh, uh, completely different, and therefore this could be considered uh, in the future. Uh, uh, other very important message is uh, grade 1 and grade 2, as you can see, the survival is, is significantly different in comparison with uh, grade 3 and grade 4 uh, cancer. But uh, the most important uh, um, um, prognostic factors are represented by lymph node involvement. As you can see, patients with lymph node involvement at the diagnosis uh, showed a five-year uh, recurrence-free survival of 26.8% of the cases, and also the patient with distant metastasis showed a similar five-year recurrence-free uh, survival. What's about cancer-specific survival? This is the um, uh, survival curves uh, showing the five years and ten years cancer specific survival and at the multivariable analysis uh, we had the same uh, results that uh, I uh, showed before for uh, recurrence free survival. Again uh, the only difference is, is that mode of presentation turned out to be an independent predictor of cancer specific survival and as you can see incidental tumor showed uh, uh, cancer specific survival significantly better in comparison with patients with local symptoms or, above all, with patients with systematic uh, symptoms. Of course, uh, our study uh, has some uh, uh, study limitation. Uh, the first one is that this is a retrospective analysis. At the same time, uh, we included uh, data coming from 16 centers, then this is a multi-surgeon series. Uh, the specimen uh, was evaluated by multiple pathologists without slight revision, and uh, the treatment for disease re uh, recurrences was not standardized. And again, uh, without slide review, it was was not possible for us to assign correctly uh, the uh, subdivision of the papillary RCC in type 1 and type 2 according to uh, the Lawent and Ibley uh, classification. And it seems to be that this is important according to this paper published by UCLA showing that type 1 tumor is uh, significantly better in comparison with type 2. But I would like to ask you to pay attention when we use this, this, this uh, subclassification between type 2 and type 1 
because looking at the literature, uh, uh, this uh, subtyping remains difficult and different percentages of type 1 and type 2 are reported in the published series. This means that it is very difficult for the pathologist uh, correctly assign uh, the type 2 papillary and then uh, we need to have very experienced pathologists to have correct um, evaluation of this uh, parameter. Another uh, important uh, point that it, uh, it, it was not evaluated in the Saturn project was the role of a nuclear grade. Uh, in this publication, some pathologists support the use of the nuclear grading uh, instead of the formal grade uh, for papillary RCC. And in this more recent paper uh, coming from the US uh, UCLA, Clayt and co-workers uh, showed that uh, nuclear grading seems to be uh, more uh, predictive in comparison with the nuclear grading, as you can see looking at the different values of the concordance uh, index. Another param parameter that it was not evaluated because uh, was uh, uh, available only in a, a small percentages of our cases was uh, coagulative necrosis. As you can see in the experience of the Mayo Clinic, coagulative necrosis for papillary RCC is not important. Vice versa, when we consider the experience of the UCLA uh, necrosis turned out to be in papillary RCC an independent predictors of cancer-specific survival. Then, in conclusion, I think that uh, this data uh, can um, demonstrate that uh, papillary RCC is, is a low-risk um, uh, tumor recurrence and cancer-related death after surgery. At the same time, we must pay uh, more attention for patients with papillary RCC with lymph node involvement involvement and presence of distant metastasis and above all uh, for patients with grade 3 and grade 4 uh, nuclear grading according to uh, Foreman. Uh, more attention uh, we must pay for the uh, correct allocation of the subtype and sub uh, 1 and 2 uh, in this category of tumors and I think that to have more and more information and to better um, uh, identify the uh, characteristics of, the, uh, of this tumor, we must uh, consider in the next future uh, more, uh, more studies con including molecular and cytogenetic prognostic factors. Thank you so much for your attention. That's kidney cancer news for this month. I'm Carrie Kanoski, wishing you good health. <laughs>